So I would like to informally welcome you to this installment of the 17th Annual Reshaping Rochester Lecture Series. Um, I thank you for joining us for this week's follow-up community conversation to last week's presentation by Anna Musig, which was excitingly at the Memorial Art Gallery in person, although she was in San Francisco. Uh, so any of you who don't know me, my name is Monica Reifenstein, and I'm the Interim Executive Director at the CECR. This year, we've been exploring the theme, The Ideal City, um, and what it means to be ideal, what's required to move our community towards ideal, um, all those fun things. All of our speakers prior to Anna Musig said that they didn't think that the ideal city exists or that it should be an end goal. And I think probably they're all ultimately on the same page as the ideal city as being something that is, uh, you know, always changing, always moving, um, not necessarily an, an, an end goal that we can point to. So today we're going to be unpacking her talk and connecting uh, the ideas and strategies that she brought up to our own local context with the help of some local experts um, and of course, all of you in attendance. Since it's also our final community conversation of the 2022 series, uh, we're gonna be zooming out a bit and acknowledging some overarching themes and anything that stood out to you as important or relevant or interesting. So we'll just do a quick recap of uh, what the series looked like this year so that we were all on the same page. Uh, we started off the series with Rick Cole, the executive director of CNU, and he took us through these very basic ABCs of urbanism, which was a good uh, starting point for us. And then we moved into a presentation by Dr. Andre Perry, and he helped us understand the devaluation of black homes and businesses and also the long-term cumulative impact of that. And uh, then we moved on with Dr. Samina Raja, who helped us understand the power of community centered planning in creating equitable food systems. And then we, in May, talked with Rebecca Evans about how we might decarbonize our cities. And then finally, last week, our final June presentation, we discussed human skill design in the public realm with Anna Music. And excitingly, Anna also gave us a little manifesto for the ideal city that I think is a really cool thing to point to and that we can spend some time looking at today if you all would like to. So before we officially get into the conversation, I just have a few thank yous. First of all, uh, the New York State Council on the Arts, who has made all of our work possible through their generous support over the years. And we also rely on the generous support of individuals in our community. So big thank you goes out to everyone on this list. And we extend an invitation to anyone who values the work that we do to learn more about how you can join our circle. Big thank you to our major sponsors of the lecture series, the ESL Charitable Foundation, as well as the Rochester Area Community Foundation. We're truly grateful for their commitment to the series and literally wouldn't be able to do it without them. So big thanks to them. And there's, of course, a variety of other organizations that, that generously support us throughout the year. I'm grateful to all these folks, especially our exclusive media sponsor, WXXI, AA Rochester, who's our continuing education credit sponsor. And they're not on here, but Hedonist Artisan Chocolates as well. And these are all the folks behind the scenes that really help things roll, everyone on our lecture committee, and also Marshall Partners, who are some event consultants. So I'm really pleased that representatives from Bergman could join us today. Uh, this is an informal conversation, so I'm going to turn it over to you and let you each tell us a little bit about yourself, starting with Molly. Hi, I'm Molly Gaudioso. I'm planning project manager at Bergman. Um, I do know, I think, a couple of you that are on the call. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of work in and around the Rochester area, as well as upstate and Western New York, working with municipalities on planning, long range planning efforts, transportation planning, zoning, um, you know, all, all things related to community development. And, you know, I found particularly this year, um, that some of the presentations, I only was able to see three, but all three that I was attending, I thought were, had really good points um, and brought our conversations, I think, to a different level. So I'm um, excited to talk about that today. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Kieran Clifford. I'm a planner at Bergman. And um, like Molly, I focus on uh, projects around Rochester and New York State. Um, I have a background in regional planning, grant writing, um, economic development. I've done a little bit of everything um, except for zoning stuff. Um, and um, I'm also working on some pretty large scale projects in Rochester right now, including the Aqueduct Reimagine project. And we also just wrapped up the Interloop North Transformation Study. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Cool. Yeah, so Molly, I appreciate you uh, saying that the presentations kind of took it to a different level this year. Um, I think that when we were, when we first were designing the series um, and the theme for this year, we started thinking about uh, the 15 minute city as a concept, um, the idea that everything um, that someone needs to live, work and play would be within a 15 minute walk, bike, ride, et cetera. Um, and so we, we started thinking about what we might call it and we ended up landing on you know, this really pie in the sky terming of ideal city, um, which has been really fun to unpack, but we, we did wanna look at it from a bunch of different angles. Uh, sometimes it, in um, the design world, uh, we can get really focused on like the nitty gritty um, design details and, and whatnot. And I think this year we really did try to make it more intersectional. So I'm glad that that seemed to come across. Um, and all that said, I'd love to hear um, from our panelists and from anyone in attendance some key takeaways that you had uh, either from the Anna Music lecture in particular or from the series as a whole or things that stood out um, that were interesting to you that really made an impact, etc. So just open the floor to that. I can jump in. Um... So my key takeaway is mostly um, related to Anna Musig's uh, lecture last week. Um, so I know she talked about her, I believe she called it a manifesto that had four main pieces, um, which I believe um, off the top of my head, I don't quite remember what they were. Maybe it was public life or I don't quite remember, but. I, I have it in front of me, you know, it's human scale, most vulnerable, everyday choice and changes. Changes, got it. Thank you, Molly. Um, yeah. So. I really liked her approach to that um, as an ideal city, and that's um, you know ways to get to that point. And um, I think my biggest takeaway was to put it most simply is there's not really a one size fits all approach to doing that and to making improvements in a place. Um, you know what works in Copenhagen is not going to work in Rochester. What works in Buffalo isn't going to work in Rochester necessarily. Um, so it all really depends on the place. And that's kind of the magic of planning. Um, you're working with the communities to figure out what will work. Yeah, it's, it's the challenge and the opportunity, right? So that was my key takeaway. Yeah, I guess I'll go um, sort of continue on that thought. Um, you know, I one of the things that I think we struggle with, or at least I struggle with in working with um, some of the communities that we do is, challenging certain mindsets on how you can achieve these things and why they're important. And I felt like there was a lot of conversation um, across you know, each of these uh, the sessions. So the, the three that I was able to attend were Rick Cole, um, Dr. Andre Perry, as well as Anna um, Music. And I just felt like you know, um, Rick Cole, I think started sort of the tone of this building off of what Kiernan was saying with, a different message actually than what I had kind of heard from the Congress of New Urbanism before and acknowledging that not every community is going to be the dense urban, you know, uh, main street that, you know, we're looking at. I mean, we talk a lot about the transect and how it has a place. Um, each of those elements have a place in community and the importance of understanding where they're located, right? So, I mean, I think with Sprawl, one of the things is we're sort of seeing a, a middle or a, well, I mean, it's poor design, but <laughs> we're seeing a middle density that, you know, is, is expanding, right, too, you know, too far and, and starts to build on, remove that human scale and everything that we talked about before. So, you know, it was interesting to look at all those principles and things that Anna brought up in that context and understand how does that fit um, in a village, in a town, in a city, um, in a more rural community versus, um, you know, some of the more urban communities and 
how you can demonstrate their functionality and make it work for what they have. Um, you know, again, too, I, I think that Anna did a good job talking about some of the challenges that we have in the equity component of it and where we focus um, the application of some of these design principles as well. Um, so that was, you know, an interesting thing to hear. Any other key takeaways from our attendees? You're welcome to turn on camera and sound or type in the chat, we'll, we'll monitor it. Give you a second. Um, something that, that really- Can I call on Joe? Oh, you can. I Is Joe ready? Joe, do you have something? <laughs> well, I, can, I can try to be ready. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, sorry, I'm just trying to, I'm, my camera's off because I'm in, eating lunch right now, but- uh, <laughs> That's okay, we appreciate it. So, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but I, I would be curious, Joe, you know, in knowing that um, kind of as we've worked together over the years too and your transportation focus, um, you know, obviously GTC works in a lot of different community environments as well. I would just be interested to kind of hear your thoughts. Um, okay, there I am. Let me just move the camera over. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one thing that um, I took away from, from this conference, and this is something that I've been thinking about for a while, and maybe it's a fairly basic idea, I'm not really sure, but it's the challenge of looking at things on plans versus sort of in the real world or at the street. It's one thing to map something out and say, oh, this is a nice looking plan and everything's very symmetrical and organized and, you know, theoretically everything's within a five, 10 minute walk or whatever. And then you actually start getting down into the nitty gritty of how what actually gets built on the ground and all that and how it actually works. And that's where the real challenges come up because you have um, all kinds of, you know, and, and I'm sure Molly and Kieran have observed this as well, all kinds and others, all kinds of sort of unanticipated um, challenges that you have to rise that you didn't really think through or didn't realize was an issue. And now it's like, well, how, how do we deal with that? Um, so that's sort of, you know, I'm certainly in, in broad agreement with everything that, that Anna was saying. And unfortunately, I missed some of the earlier lectures, but uh, um, it's, it's just a big challenge in our, in our profession. And I've been working planning now for, geez, going on 16 years. And that's something that I, I've never really, to be honest, come up with a, come up with a good um, sort of solution for. So um, I don't know if that gets to what you're asking about, Molly, but. Yeah. Um, I think you brought up a good point, Joe. Um, I know that Anna did mention, she talked about the user experience versus design, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting. And um, to bring it specific to Rochester, um, I can think of a, a specific parcel downtown, um, parcel five, which for a while was just a lot full of rocks, but people were still using it. Um, and now today it has grass on it and um, it's being used as intended. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at it from that aspect. Oh, sure. And I think it's, uh, you know, you hear a lot about um, the need for like, you know, programming space, and designing public spaces that can be programmed, which I think is great, you know, for like planning festivals and all of that. But then there's, I, I never like to lose sight of the, the benefits of, of sort of the um, spontaneity and having a place that you can go just to kind of get away from everything and, and take 30 minutes on your lunch break and just walk around and not be connected and not have to worry about, you know, this app or, or whatever, you know? Um, so it's, you know, but then how do you, again, how do you sort of manage that space so that it's, um, you know, it, it's kept kind of for the purpose that it's, it's intended for. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know, it's tough, but, but then also I recognize that in a, a dynamic uh, city, you know, there's always, there's constant sort of re, um, reuse of space and, and nothing really stays the same for very long. So we have to kind of factor all that into our thinking as well. But, so. yeah. yeah, I think something that, you know, again, came out of um, Anna's presentation that had me start thinking, and I've been thinking about this with like broader policy issues. So for example, like recycling, you know, people are not necessarily going to be likely to recycle if you make it really hard for them. And, you know, if they have to go through all these hoops and, and things, you right. So, you know, the city started to get there with like single stream recycling, things like that. But we know, obviously, it's we're not achieving the recycling goals that I think we're, you know, we want to. And she made that point of designing for helping to make, you know, make it easier for people to make 
choices, you know, healthier choices, better choices, um, particularly right thinking about active transportation. You know, there's a necessity for some people to utilize, um, you know, sidewalks, bike to work, things like that. But, you know, to make them more viable transit, to make them more viable, it needs to be something that becomes, you know, convenient and attractive to more users. So you are sort mm -hmm. of nudging people to make that decision, right? I mean, that's something that I'd kind of talked about back when uh, Reimagine RTS was going about is, you know, clearly we want the system to work for the users that depend on it, but to help increase its viability and ability to expand um, as, you know, a network, it needed to be able to function as a, you know, as a level of convenience for users by choice as well. So, um, you know, that's something I, I think we did a good job nudging that with more frequent service and, and things. Um, but yeah, I really appreciated how she was speaking to that um, because I think a lot of people don't, you just don't think about, it. <laughs> you, you know, you, mm -hmm. Joe, you don't think about going out, you know, if you don't have that space, going out for lunch, taking that walk, clearing your head, which we all know promotes physical health, mental health, you know, better connects um, people to their communities instead of just being shut into their home, their car, or their office. Um, it's, you know, something that fosters a better sense of community as well. So we need to create those opportunities um, for connectivity and support that level of decision making. It's interesting. Too, one thing I've learned, especially since the pandemic or pandemic has been going on, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, so I'm actually working from home today. I'm, I'm calling in from home office. Um, you know, sometimes I go out for a walk at lunchtime from home and I still, I still feel like I'm playing hooky because I'm like walking around, I live in a very residential neighborhood um, and I'm walking around this neighborhood and I'm thinking like, oh, I don't really, I sort of almost like feel out of place, even though it's my, my home neighborhood. Whereas when I'm walking around downtown, I feel very much in place. It's like, well, uh, you know, downtown work, I'm just on a lunch break, you know, like you see a lot of people. And so it's, it's sort of um, interesting how very familiar kind of comfortable spaces, you know, when you sort of think of them differently or approach them differently, how you can have a very different sort of um, interaction. So um, I'm not trying to be too philosophical here, but I mean, <laughs> as is something that I've, I've, I've noticed, so. Yeah, there's a lot at play there that's probably intersecting, including like capitalism of it all and, you know, what it means to rest and and what spaces you're allowed to rest in and when. So it's, it's definitely interesting to think about. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, yeah, that, that idea of, at the everyday choice, I think is what she called it, um, making the everyday choice what's right for society, the best choice for society as a whole. And that stuck with me too, in general, like the human psychology of it all. Um, people need to, need to be able to make choices quickly and easily and not think about it. And uh, this actually reminded me of something that, our, um, that came up in our, our May conversation about decarbonization. Um, there was someone, there was an article that was discussing how architecture and planning are really behind in the sustainable um, revolution uh, and climate change action. And, and this person who was commenting on that said, there needs to be an Ikea kit for turning like current build builds into um, sustainable uh, builds. And it's not just, cause obviously it's not just about the new builds, which you know we're doing, um, but that, that uh, that changing and how it needs to just be something you can pick up and do and not think about for, for everyday person, for the everyday person. Um, and, and that definitely, uh, that connection came into my mind. And, you know, as humans, we, we're predictable and we are also, we don't really go out of our way to do something that requires extra thought. We all have a lot in our brains all the time. Um, there was one, one thought, let's see, let me look at my notes quick. There was a really good example. Hmm, I'll have to come back to it. Um, but just, the, yeah, just, I really like all of your thoughts and ideas, especially like with the recycling thing. Um, I, I am like very dedicated to recycling and it's still, when I get something that says like drop off at store, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> it's like, it's just unfortunately gonna go into the trash can. So, so yes. yeah, just that I, choice idea. Yeah, so guilty pleasure is Taco Bell. And um, I drove through there, was going through their drive through Urbanist and I'm sure, but it was Webster. Um, <laughs> so drove through their, their drive through and uh, saw they had this sign about recycling their sauce packets. 
right? Because sometimes they give you like a hundred. So I'm like, is this, are we recycling empty sauce packets? Are we recycling like on new sauce, pa sauce packets? What is this? So I go and I look at it. I'm like, this is interesting. It's, you have to like package them up and send them back, right? It was like, and I'm just like this, who, who's gonna do this? <laughs> like who's gonna go through that process, right? To, to recycle them and in that way, I just thought it was kind of moot. Like that's one of those, I think, greenwashing type things that we end up seeing. It's like, look at this program we released, but in practicality, does it work? Yeah. Probably not. Indeed. Well, I know in some cases, like certain items, if there's like a refrigerant in it, you have to like pay, I think it's like $15 per item. Like um, a few years ago, I had a small refrigerator and an oil air conditioner that I took out to the recycling center uh, by the airport. Um, and, was, you know, you drive in there. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but still you got to pay for it and all that. But again, if someone, someone isn't willing to do that or getting back to the transportation, if they don't have the vehicle and the time to actually drive out there and, and do that, then they're probably not going to, right? So, um, so all these different things that, like you say earlier, Molly, some, some people just do without really thinking. It's like, well, you know, how do other people interact with their spaces? What do they really need? Um, and how do we as a, a city in a metropolitan area, you know, best serve that? I mean, I've, and I think, I, I, I'm sure Kieran and Molly have heard me talk before, you know, the city of Rochester, the boundaries go back to about a hundred years, I think the mid 1920s when they were, you know, the current configuration. So, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's enough to think about things on just a city level issue. I mean, maybe in terms of like implementation and how we um, um, manage certain services, that's fine. But, you know, we really, we have to be looking at a regional scale for things like transportation, you know, uh, flood protection, natural resource protection, all those kinds of uh, activities. So um, I'm actually, not to hijack the conversation, I, I put in a proposal for the, the APA uh, conference in Buffalo in October about those kinds of issues. So I'm hopefully we'll get picked. And if you guys are interested, you can go there and uh, we can we can talk more about it, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is something in the chat from Tom Morgan, so I'll just, I'll read that aloud. Uh, Tom says, is it appropriate to ask those who interact with our local and state governments how things appear to be going under our new city and county governments? Are positions moderating in things like the State Street near Andrews renovation, specifically regarding bicycle access directly to the street? Early answers were, you have the Riverway Trail, which isn't quite true including winter maintenance, which begs the RTS access question too. I, I think I could speak a little bit to the first part of that question and maybe I'll give Kieran some opportunity to talk about any of the connectivity that's come up with the Rochester projects we've been working on. But I, I mean, I think it's totally appropriate to kind of have that conversation. Um, I know personally, I working with the um, Rock City Coalition and our young professional organizations. We recently held a, a young professional town hall with the mayor. And, you know, he seems really energized around a lot of things that involve planning, um, you know, the basics of looking at how all of these things are interconnected, um, picking up on, you know, the broader visioning exercises, not necessarily just putting in, you know, the check in the box and saying, well, we have right? We have this trail. Well, is it being utilized, right? Is it, is it serving um, the community the way it should? And so I was really encouraged by that. And I've also kind of heard from some colleagues that are at City Hall that they feel like sort of a tone has changed um, with the administration as well, um, you know, particularly with like some of the uh, planning reviews and things. There's sort of more openness to the mentality that we've been putting in our plans for years, but haven't necessarily been seeing come to fruition in our actual um, investment. So, you know, I was encouraged by that. Um, obviously, I know, I think we are a city that, and I've, everybody's heard me say this a lot, but I think we are a city that's sort of um, stuck at the hands of some suburban and outside community mentalities, um, you know, where and where dollars can come from that don't necessarily align with, I think a lot of the things that people who live in the city might think are um, really important. So, um, you know, I see that as uh, a big opportunity for advancing some of the stuff that's been on the back burner for a while. And I could jump in just to talk about trail connectivity. Um, 
So there's two major projects that either just wrapped up or ongoing right now, um, including the Interim North Conservation Study, which should be made publicly available very soon um, on the project website, interlukenorth.com. But um, that proposes, that's proposing extending that uh, Union Street cycle track all the way through the Interloop corridor. Um, so you could basically ride the cycle track from Union Street all the way to the Cascade District. And then um, with the Aqueduct Reimagined project, which is ongoing right now, we actually just began the community engagement aspect of that. And um, there's gonna actually be another um, public event on July 21st, so mark your calendars for that. Um, we're gonna have a design charrette. Um, that project is proposing, you know, connecting um, the riverway trail through downtown Rochester along the river. Um, so not only is it proposing to, uh, you know, turn the Broad Street Bridge into a pedestrian only space, it's proposing adding some uh, riverfront promenades along some of those buildings along the river, like the library and the aqueduct building um, and connecting to the Riverside Convention Center's terrace and getting connection to, um, is it the Charles Carroll Park that they're working on right now and connecting there um, from you know, that new promenade behind Dinosaur Barbecue and the Riverway Trail. So you'll be able to experience being along the river on your bike or as a pedestrian um, without having to go on leaving the river, essentially. You don't have to go onto the downtown streets. You can stay on these trails and experience closeness to the water, which I think is a unique experience. And we don't really have that in downtown at this moment. Um, and it's really just giving space back to pedestrians and bicyclists. I think John I'm Joel oh. has been promoting, there's one section on the Northern section of the Riverway Trail that currently the plans are calling, I don't remember the exact section, I'm thinking it may be the, the Interloop North area where they've got to go away from the river and up and cross a very busy road and then back instead of going underneath the road through a maybe a fairly narrow uh, right of way, but that would allow for a true along the river path that was much safer for the bicyclists and the pedestrians. Um, that's it's been posted on Facebook and you know, like the Rochester Urbanist or the bicycle groups a few times. And I know John is a is definitely a bicycle advocate from way back. Any thoughts there? And and again. State Street really got to me because I was, I got very active about the time they were doing the East Main Street meetings and we had good success there. And then there were some, we thought we had, we, we, were, we were told we got everything we wanted. And then a month or two later, it came out that, you know, some changes were trying to be made. So they had to have another meeting and they heard loud and clear, that's not what we said. And it got back to closer to the original, uh, which was good. And that project is moving along. You know, the, the, the side, the eastbound side is done. The westbound side is getting there. Um, but the whole State Street answer, you know, you've got the Riverway Trail. Well, that doesn't get you up and down both sides of State Street. It seems like there are no north-south major roads that really do have an extended bicycle network. They've all been, maybe the rationale was, well, you've got, you've got the, the trail has always been the answer. I don't know. I do know, I, I, maybe the current, maybe the form, I don't know how to word this. Did we have a change in the, the Department of Public Works Management? Did he retire? The, the, I know. DES um, has a new director, um, okay. right? That's we, Rich Perrin now, I believe. Because I know there seemed to be a little, I haven't got the budget to do it, so it's not getting taken care of. So if you're on one hand saying, well, here's your bicycle trail for year round access, but we're not gonna maintain it when there's snow. And it also doesn't really main, you know, give you the access. I see the Riverway Trail from talking to people who our full-time bicyclists as a great expressway for bicyclists from the U of R complex to downtown. For those who are commuting that distance, it's great because it gets them away from any intersections, what have you. And it's great for 
your casual sightseeing, enjoying the river. I don't see it as great for the people who are downtown and trying to go the half quarter, one mile between places where they need to be on both sides of roads. I mean, State Street, particularly now, and, and maybe part of that pushback was people who are investing want more parking because they're investing in those buildings. But there's a lot of apartments going in and there that, you know, between the businesses on the first floor and then the apartments, there's a potential for a lot of bicyclists there that don't take up a lot of street need, but have some. Does that, that all make sense? I mean, yeah, it does to me. I don't know the specific context of that, but I know in other, to that exact example, but I know in other communities, it's a struggle to balance sort of the loudest demand of users um, and the designation of space. So if, and when bicyclists, I, Full disclosure, I am not a cyclist. Um, so, you know, I mean, um, but that is something that is an important connection. I mean, like you're saying, you don't want to just, in the same way that one of my biggest gripes about parking lots is everyone becomes a pedestrian at their destination. So why we just dump people in parking lots is so irritating to me because we just create this extremely unsafe environment. Everyone wants to complain about the East Avenue Wegmans parking lot. If we just instead of having the spaces butt up against each other, gave some space for a walkway in between them, we'd maybe lose a row or two of parking in the entirety of the, the lot itself, but people would not be in the access drives anymore. <laughs> it would be really, really helpful to have something like that, right? Um, and I, um, I see that being exactly what you're talking about. I mean, maybe you use the trail for your, your longer commutes or whatever, but Ultimately, if you need to get off that trail or you need to make some of these smaller destinations, how do you navigate that environment? And, you know, I know that um, like our DOTs maybe been a little slow to adapt some of these uh, things. And we're really concerned about, um, you know, how bikes navigate the uh, bus lanes and all, all that other stuff. I mean, all of that was heard with like the Main Street piece too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I see it. I, I hear you, I, I agree. It's, I just don't necessarily, I don't know if we always have a good answer. But the maintenance piece too that, that you were talking about, it's, I had heard, uh, you know, I'm kind of talking with, um, ran into Rich Perrin actually um, during the winter time and he was getting a, a lot of phone calls and. You know, their department was getting a lot of requests and issues with not just um, snow plowing roadways, people's driveways getting, you know, blocked and things like that, but obviously like sidewalks as well. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have. And maybe one of the reasons, right, why the municipalities or decision makers are hesitant to continue to expand these services is because we're sort of digging ourselves out of a hole in maintaining the accessibility and the quality of some of what we have already. Right. So it's like, how do we broaden this perspective to better manage what we have as well as extend expanding that connectivity? Because we all know that it just gets better if you can do both those things, but resources are limited. Um, so, you know, I think that can be a, a difficulty with that as well. I don't envy that position <laughs> to, oh. to know to know how, you know. It's, it's certainly very important, um, but at the same time, right, if that big snowstorm came and you've got all these people calling about how they, you know, driveway, they can't get down their street. I live on a street with a median. I mean, they literally had to bring like one of those backhoe trucks in because um, our street is narrow, right? And my thought is, well, why don't we have trucks that could better navigate, right? Like we, ha we know we have some smaller right of ways. Do, do we need to acquire some equipment that can better um, handle that. And so the immediate need was to respond to the roadways and then ultimately the sidewalks and I, those policy decision-making uh, components, difficult for sure. Yeah, it's exciting. And I bet, you know, right out in front of Monica was one of the worst situations as far as bus stops with that brand new sidewalk and, and bike pathway, you couldn't, get to the bus kiosk most of the winter because of the plowing from the streets mm -hmm. and 
maybe some of that obligation falls on the building owner that fronts it. And the question is, okay, which building owner? Is it the one who owns the Hungerford building or is it the one that owns the small store in front? And where does his end versus the other? Um, I'd love to see geothermal like they, I'm told Holland, Michigan has geothermal installed to take care of their sidewalks and what have you. So that you could actually melt it all. Yeah, all of the, the larger snow events this year that seemed to, it would be nothing and then a ton of, a ton of snow suddenly, that really brought up a lot of, um, let's say, I feel like weakness is the wrong word. <laughs> Areas of vulnerability in our in our, uh, yeah. our system. Um, and I know that um, our neighbor here, Reconnect Rochester, uh, they they put a lot of thought into snow removal and how different modes of transit um, and different tr types of transit users um, will navigate in that kind of thing in the future. Um, so I believe they're working on on a snow removal plan that they're going to be discussing with some some leadership in the city, and hopefully uh, that will be revealed sometime in the summer to get it right at the forefront of people's minds and start thinking about it. Um, who has the responsibility? Um, what do we want from our our municipal leaders, what do we need from them? What are they responsible for, et cetera? So it's definitely something to be thinking about. And there's also a um, a blog that was that was posted about uh, snow removal in Montreal and how maybe we might we might get some uh, pointers from another snowy area around here. I mean, I do think right. This isn't new. We get a snowstorm every year. So I think that some of that, right, I mean, could be built into some of that planning. I, we get so excited, right, about some of these things. And I, we see it in a lot of communities, like the maintenance aspect, right, is, is really difficult. Um, communities I work with that don't have planning departments, right, I mean, they struggle, a, a development plan comes in and they struggle to be able to review it effectively. You know, we when we help them update plans or codes and things, we have to be thinking about, do they have the capacity to really be administering this at the level that it needs to be? I mean, how, how complex, how, um, how can we make it more effective um, and manageable? And I think that goes to our infrastructure as well, right? I mean, I don't think sometimes we really lose sight of that, of how ultimately it's gonna be managed, right? I think a lot of us think about these environments in the peak of our spring and summer when it's super nice and it's gonna look really great. And, you know, everybody has the opportunity to get out there, more motivated to get out there. It's not as cold, it's a nice day. And the reality is we're a four season community. We need to be, you know, thinking about a lot of stuff today, a, a heat issue, right? I mean, street trees, cover, shade, right? That's one thing I think is potentially missing with parcel five. It's if you've got a, a hot day or something like that. I mean, you know, my my mind was switched. I, I actually was originally in a camp of, well, it is an opportunity for development, but kind of seeing, I've, I've, we've seen the user speak for it. It's, it's not a dead space. It's, you know, it is something that has been very valuable um, to the residents, to visitors, to our festivals, to people who work downtown, all of those things. And so I, you know, I think we just need to kind of continually revisit how our plans are coming to fruition. Are they working the same way? Is there something that, you know, we can learn um, from the first couple of years of, you know, that being in place? Um, I think that's, you know, we keep, we keep striving for the ideal city, right? But there's, there's a component of making sure that you can maintain and that we can really make what we have more effective as well. Um, and just kind of a last thought of that too is something I'm trying to think about more and more is the equity issue of it. I mean, even going back to snow removal and things like that, the loudest voices are likely not those people that are most reliant on sidewalks or some, you know, other, the uh, digging out bus stops, things like that. Um, you know, so how do we build that into our maintenance models um, and things? I think that'd be really a, a really important aspect of revisiting. <clears throat> yeah. It's, I just um, wanted to, uh, add something here. My name is Evelyn Irons. My camera's not working, so I apologize for that. 
Um, but I joined this series because uh, I represent an area in the city that's a food desert and we don't have a grocery store. And so I wanted to find out exactly what your series offered on that. The bonus to that is that I've been able to learn a lot more, right? I've been able to engage with the other parts of the series that has enlightened me on how some of the things work throughout the city when they're doing these revitalizations. Um, and we have a lot of uh, what I call the forgotten communities, right? So when I hear someone talk about trees, I love that aspect, but I live in a community where we, don't, we won't have the opportunity to enjoy the trees because of safety. And I've said to the mayor is that you can put as many trees as you want to, but we want to enjoy the shade of those trees, like you guys are talking about when they're added to some of the locations. And so what I found is, is like Molly just mentioned, some of these voices um, from a community for which I serve um, are not being heard. And so this gave me an opportunity to meet people, to understand what the strategic plan is as we move forward on projects, right? So I come um, with a big project experience background and I understand, you know, nothing happens overnight. But when I think about the presentation and the aspect of change, I think about the mindset of the people that live in the city of Rochester, that some of these forgotten communities and in, in, I'm in the Lyle Otis area um, and a lot of these communities, we didn't have a voice. And so that's the reason why I uh, stand up in meetings like this, just to say to people that, yes, we enjoy the aspects of what you're doing now, but these forgotten communities where we're dealing with a lot of safety issues also have an umbrella of issues that we want uh, done in our communities, right? We ride plenty bikes, right? Um, I, I was out gardening a few minutes ago and there was like eight or nine people that came by riding bikes. And so um, we ride plenty bikes in our neighborhood um, and it's a way of transportation for many of the residents because they don't have um, their own personal transportation. But this has enlightened me because I have a vision, right? And I have a mission uh, for the Lyle Oldest Community Organization. And a part of that is knowing that uh, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of things that's already turning. Uh, how do I incorporate, um, engage, um, acknowledge what's already in place and at the same time, uh, make sure that the voice is heard for, for the Lyle Otis area. So that's what brought me here um, from, a, from a community perspective. Um, and I think uh, working with the city, I'm learning a lot about uh, you know, some of the, the practices and how some of these projects come forward, some of the outside agencies that I didn't know about. Um, and uh, it's been it's been enlightening. And so I want to thank you guys for sharing this um, and uh, just just as a mindset um, to reach those hands out to those unfor those forgotten communities. We want trees too, but we want to be able to enjoy them and be safe. We, we really do want trees. <laughs> and we do believe in recycling. Um, um, one of the things we're doing in one of our community gardens is is that, we're using pallets. And so those pallets were asking community groups and community agencies in all agencies to adopt a pallet as a fundraiser. And so it'll feed the community, right? Help us with that. And at the same time, we'll be recycling. And we do understand we have to use, you know, certain types of pallets. We can't just use any pallet um, because of safety. Um, but that's some of the things we do and feel that's important um, in our spaces for uh, recycling. Was it the thank uh, meeting before the last one where connected, I think it was connected communities. We were, we were talking about the food deserts and what have you. And I had asked about the pie in the sky idea of, you know, offering out fruit trees to city homeowners to plant in their front yards that you know, then over time the neighborhood could benefit from and they said there was actually a plan to start doing things like that and molly parcel five i think is maybe the classic incremental improvement uh building yes momentum because you had the dichotomy 
of opinions on you tore down a huge tax base and you've replaced it with nothing. You lost all that tax revenue, but now you're seeing it used as a truly uh, community gathering spot, regardless of income. Everybody can go to the free concerts and enjoy it. The fact that you got grass to begin with, I think initially it was a, well, we'll put some grass out there to keep the mud down, but we're, we're gonna, still gonna build. And now I think you're gaining that momentum where people are gonna say, hey, we don't wanna build that. So I think maybe you will start to get trees. But you, yes, I, you absolutely need them in Lyle Otis. The whole city, you know, new construction is easy. You can make the landscaping and trees part of the requirement of the developers because they've got the deep pockets. Even if they're getting funding for, you know, subsidized housing, they've got the relatively deep pockets and it's relatively cheap for them to do because they're buying in bulk and they've got the earth moving equipment to do it all fairly easily. Going back into the older neighborhoods where maybe you had trees and they've exceeded their life expectancy or they've come down with diseases and trying to repopulate becomes a real issue, but we need to address it. I think there is a program um, that you can ask the city, like if you want to, if you don't currently have a tree in your tree lawn, you can ask the city for one and they will come out and plant it. Um, my sister found, found that, I, I, I haven't seen it, but I do think that's out there. I think one of the interesting things like, you know, bring up trees on like parcel five again, right? This is something to consider constraints of infrastructure again too, right? And how we have to be creative because we park in the three-story parking garage underneath that. So, you know, we can't necessarily just be putting these giant, beautiful trees there that their roots may start to compromise that infrastructure underneath, or it might not be viable, right, for those trees to even grow there. And so, you know, I, I think that's really interesting. And that's where we just as a community need to start being creative. I mean, is it a mix of um, hardscape and greenery that, you know, can grow around a, a structure, um, a, a shade structure or, or something like that. You know, I think that's really interesting. Um, and, you know, Evelyn, that's really awesome to hear um, to, to make that connection. And I, you know, I'm always, we've heard, and there was a study done even, right, that Rochester is a city of silos, both within our government and in our community. And so it's really important that the more that we can try to bridge this communication, you know, barrier um, and start to engage different, communities and neighborhoods and even just talking about the opportunity and making people aware of you know what can be done and resources and things that are available I think is really important it makes me think of a while ago it was I think it was at some point last year but the former commissioner of parks from New York City came and was talking about you know how they had realized that there were people were talking about community parks and things they realized they had this huge network of neighborhood park neighborhood parks but they had yeah mitch silver that's right they had not revisited them i mean they had no idea of their condition they they weren't maintaining them they weren't you know looking at how they were being used adaptation they be made a lot of them were built in a time in a time in which we were putting fences between the edge of the park and sidewalks and things it's just not you know it's, not uh, creating that level of access that you want, feeling more like a fortress, a lot of hardscape. Um, and so, you know, that was really interesting is that he, as part of that effort said, you know, we need to take stock of what we have and then we need to make a plan to kind of go back and really start to invest in these areas that have been long forgotten, which obviously a ton of them were in, you know, uh, very low income neighborhoods um, and in minority neighborhoods that were just overlooked for a really long time. So that was really, I, I thought for I, that made me want to literally go like, see if we could inventory the city parks and look like when was the last time we, you know, put money in, in some of our different parks and how is it that we can maybe create, reach out to the neighborhoods to identify, you know, should it be a, a passive park? Should it be programmed? Should it have rec facilities? Um, you know, is, what is the, what do the neighbors use it for? Things like that. 
how do you foster safety, right, Evelyn? That's that's really important. Molly, I had heard about the Verge Tree program. What I was throwing out went a little beyond that to have actual fruit trees on the other side of the sidewalk where it was actually on the people's private property to be able to add more green and add you know, food component, which might not work as well in the verge where you've got the road salt and what have you. Thank you everyone for all of those thoughtful comments. Anybody else have some thoughts to share? We're getting a little close to the end of our hour together. I wanna make sure everyone has a chance to share thoughts that have been prevalent to them throughout the series or that were interesting to them last week, et cetera. I have a, a oh, oh, go. Go ahead. I'll just make one one comment. I mean, our conversation didn't didn't necessarily go there, and I think it's probably more tied to my nerdiness with zoning anyway. But the equity and um, racial racist history of zoning has obviously um, a lot. It's been known, but I don't think recognized in our professions for a really long time and acknowledged. And the seeing um, the uh, housing assessment. Um, by Dr. Andrea Perry presentation really was something I was very interested in hearing about because we have a really hard time demonstrating to communities why that's important. And what's a super unfortunate is that a lot of the conversations and what resonates most with people is the lost, right, revenues, the, the you know, valuation behind it. And so to see, you know, this, uh, complete disconnect between white neighborhoods and um, black neighborhoods was astonishing. I mean, I knew it was going to be, uh, there was going to be a, a disparity there, but I did not know it was going to be that 65, you know, black homes, uh, homeowners, properties being valued at 65% of that of com uh, comparable white homes. I mean, it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool to see that, to see that Biden administration was undertaking something to start to re uh, frame how we approach property assessment. And again, working with some of the communities we do, I strongly want to start nudging them in that direction to take a look at that more equitable approach. Um, you know, as they start talking about, oh, we're going to do, you know, we're up for reassessment, things like that. Well, hey, you know, take a look at this because um, it's going to really be a good step. Um, for your community. So I love that one for sure. But I know it's probably way more in the nitty gritty than, than a lot of other people. It was um, a really important conversation. And I, Dr. Perry did a really good job with, with the numbers and the data of it, because that's what people need. Um, you can talk about sociological studies that are like peer reviewed and totally accurate. And you can talk about people's individual experiences, which are the most valuable. But until you show someone a chart, <laughs> They, they're not gonna fully understand it unless it's something that they've experienced. So that was definitely a highlight um, for our overarching series, like not even just this year, but in general. And then one of the things I think about when you think about charts and I always say metrics don't have opinions, right? So they are, they are what they are. Um, and, and, and a factual base show us a picture that we might not have seen otherwise. So, you know, it's, it's always, uh, it's always the double fold that they, they do add quite a bit of value to conversations around change and, and how change will be implemented. But I, I just wanted to personally thank you guys. This was a wonderful series and it, it really was uh, enlightening and I've been able to share that. So my, my final question is, is that how is, with the series being over, how do you stay engaged to know um, what's next? And, and, and that, that feeling for me, it's kind of, how do I stay engaged to understand how we're implementing uh, a lot of the uh, projects? There are a variety of ways of staying involved with the design center. Um, we have a newsletter that we can add you to and 
Uh, that includes a part of that newsletter each month includes opportunities for engagement um, in current projects that are underway, which we are in the midst of a lot in Rochester right now. We, in addition to the Rock the Riverway aqueduct stuff that Kieran mentioned earlier, um, where also there's some active transportation plans happening in the county and the city. Um, we're in the midst of implementing our uh, comprehensive plan that will be coming to fruition in 20, uh, 2034, um, but there's many steps along the way. Thank you for putting your email in there. I will definitely add you. Um, beyond that, I mean, the series happens each year, so definitely stay tuned for next year's series. And another thing that the Design Center offers uh, is individual workshops and charrettes, which with individual communities. Um, so I will send you um, a personal email and we can talk about that and anyone else who's interested in having the Design Center come and chat personally with your community, with some leaders in your community to talk about um, just general questions about community design planning or if there are some specific changes you want implemented, um, we're there to, to help offer some resources and give you some context and some language to start working with municipal leaders, city leaders, et cetera. So I'll definitely make those connections with you, Evelyn. Um, but everyone who's on the call and in general, anyone who's been part of the series or not, they're all welcome to all of these opportunities. So please share them um, widely. Tom, I see you say, oh, there's a county planning um, engagement opportunity today at Highland Park from three to seven. So there is stuff happening. It can be difficult to, to keep up with all of it. Um, lots of different streams of information. But... There's a, uh... oh, sorry, Monica. No, you're, you're good, go ahead. It, there's the city's also doing the um, citywide zoning code update, um, which I think is really important and is, I mean, the zoning, right, is where a lot of this comes to fruition that we talked about. So that, that's been a really important thing. Um, a lot of information about that's um, on the city website. Also, I think it's like ZAP, it's called the ZAP, yeah. the Zoning Alignment Project. And if I remember correctly from when I was on planning commission, I'm pretty sure, and you may know this already, Evelyn, but Lyle Otis has a neighborhood plan, like a neighborhood comprehensive plan. And I have no, you know, I don't know the status of that, but that might be an opportunity to approach the city and say, you know, I'd really like to take a look at this and, you know, sit down and start thinking more about the specific direction and vision of our neighborhood. Um, Cause I know a lot of like neighborhood organizations and neighborhoods themselves will engage with the city to get, you know, those, those types of plans done and put things, put projects and things on the radar, um, which is good. Are you, are you referring to the 2034 plan? No, there's, so there's neighborhood plans. Um, so, you know, like there's, uh, what's the um, one that I'm, uh, Josana uh, neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they have like their own plan that talks about a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, strategies for, you know, um, uh, home investment, streetscapes, connectivity, identifying park opportunities or investment opportunities, just setting sort of like taking a, a look at where is the neighborhood now and like what are the kinds of things that they'd like to see opportunities that exist moving forward. And those ultimately right fold into and support the city's overall comprehensive plan, but we're a pretty pretty big city with a lot of a lot of areas and and things um, and opportunities. So the neighborhoods too, I'm almost positive there's one. Maybe if you like search for it on the city website, I'm pretty sure there's a Lyle Otis conference plan, and maybe it's due um, for a, an update or a revisit. Yeah, yeah but I and I am uh, thanks, uh, John. I I've been involved with that, so I know about the zoning. So thank right. you. Great. So we are coming up while well, we're over our, our one o'clock uh, end time. I do want to give an opportunity for any final thoughts and questions. Um, but otherwise, really have appreciated having all of you with us today and throughout the series. Um, it's officially coming to an end. This is our, our last uh, event in this year's series, but we'll be starting back up next January um, as per usual. Uh, five presentations. So stay tuned for information about that. Um, the engagement opportunity that Tom mentioned at Highland Park, um, he had said it was today, but I do believe it is next week. So don't head over to the park today. <laughs> Wait until until next week, uh, three to seven. Um, 
yeah, so I'll just give you some, some really brief outro slides and then let you enjoy the rest of this very sweaty afternoon. Let's make sure that we're doing the right one. Does that look right? Good. <laughs> yes. So just wanna again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, the, the goal of, of all of this and the design center's work and of the series is to really start bridging these gaps, like was what was brought up earlier in our conversation. There's a lot of different people working in separate realms and I'm not just talking separate design realms, um, different realms in general. Uh, social work um, is, in, is related to, to community design. Um, healthcare is related to community design, um, all, of, all of that. So we really are trying to bridge these gaps and I'm glad that we seem to have started to, to do a pretty good job of that with some intersectional talks this year um, that really lived up to what we were hoping they would be. John, did you have something to add? Or are you just popping on to say hello? <laughs> yeah, I just popped on to say hello. Good awesome. to see everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, I do want to direct your attention to our next big event that will be happening before our lecture series kicks off again. Um, it's our annual Reshaping Rochester Awards. So the awards recognize exemplary regional initiatives and projects that positively impact people, neighborhoods, and the community. Um, and the nomination period opened up last week at our luncheon, so that is still open. Uh, it'll be open through mid-September. Um, I encourage you to hop on over to the website, review the nomination guidelines, and submit an application. And if you have a question about any of that, you can always just send me an email. No problems there. We really love getting a whole range of nominations and we have a variety of, of different categories that we hope will, will meet the needs of whoever you wanna honor. As usual, we will have a survey that comes in our follow-up email. Um, I'll also include a bunch of links about the different projects that we discussed today um, and information about the Design Center's short work, um, just in case some of you wanna take advantage of that. And with that, we are officially at the end of our community conversation follow-up. I thank you all for being here um, and, and thank you for helping us to officially conclude the 2022 Reshaping Rochester Lecture Series. Thanks to Molly and Kiernan, especially. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, guys. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.